But I, I think I'll kick things off while people join. I see some folks starting to join the room. Um, for attendees, if you uh, wouldn't mind, good to see some familiar names. Hi, Melissa. Um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, feel free to use the chat box, introduce yourself. If you have any burning questions for our esteemed, esteemed panel here, feel free to throw them in. Um, and I'll kick some things off now so that we can be efficient and you can not hear me drone on, but we can talk to uh, the experts here. Um, so my name is Tim Ranham, Managing Partner at Mercy Core Ventures. Uh, we are a thesis-driven investor focused on climate resilience and financial resilience. Uh, super excited to be here today uh, with Anuj, Bessie, and Rose. Um, each is building the next generation of insurance products. Um, before diving in, I want to provide a little bit of context uh, for audience members who maybe have different touch points uh, with the insurance stack. Uh, so from the floods in Germany to the dual flood and drought in Nigeria, uh, which I understand is pretty unprecedented, uh, we've seen catastrophic loss of life and destruction of property as a result of extreme weather this past year. In the reporting in the New York Times on the, German, the floods in Germany, uh, humanity hadn't seen this in perhaps a thousand years, uh, which should give us a collective pause. So the new evolving calculus for weather risk will change our food systems, urban planning, and, and really how uh, many of the world's 600 million uh, farmers uh, depend on their livelihoods. So as we look towards some of the research on insurance, Swiss Re, uh, a provider of insurance, estimates that the global financial losses resulting from these catastrophes will account for about $40 billion a year in damages, um, of which only 30% is insured. Uh, so we see a massive insurance gap, especially in emerging markets across the entire spectrum of risks. And that's what we you know, assembled this panel to discuss. Um, you know, from the uh, Colombian farmer who's looking to um, ensure their uh, coffee crop from drought uh, to a multinational supply chain in Ghana that's looking for business interruption protection or to secure some other assets uh, to uh, a government uh, that is looking for insurance product to, to secure their financial ability to respond to disasters. Uh, there's really a gap at all these levels. Um, this is from the micro, meso, and macro levels. And so that's kind of the context for the conversation today. What I think is really interesting about um, the solutions that Bessie, Rose, and Anuja's team are building is that they're kind of attacking one or more of these at the same time. And I think that's that's quite unique and shows uh, how we need kind of a comprehensive solution and it's com uh, complementary actions across all these markets. Uh, the last thing I'll leave you with is there's been a lot of really interesting research looking at how um, holistic range of insurance in a market is actually a major determinant of whether an emerging market economy is able to recover quickly and resiliently. I'll put this in the chat box, but some really interesting research that basically shows that countries that have this comprehensive stack of insurance are able to bounce back from catastrophes much more faster and inclusively than those that don't. Um, so that's why I think the importance of why we're here talking about it. Uh, so I'll hand it over to our panelists. Um, it'd be great if, uh, you know, in an introduction personally and in your company, if you kind of show where you fit in the insurance stack, uh, the micro, mesro, macro level, um, and then we'll dive into questions. And again, for, for attendees, feel free to bring your questions in here. Very happy to incorporate those so we can make this as attendee focused as possible. Uh, so maybe Rose, I'll hand it over to you first. I think you're there you go. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just gonna say, let me make sure I'm not muted. Um, so my name is Rose Goslinga. I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of Pula. Um, we do agriculture insurance. Um, we started, uh, I'm based out of Nairobi most of the time in Abuja currently. Um, we started about five, nearly six years ago. Um, our, our, main, our main objective that we saw is that there were enough insurance companies that could take on risk, but they didn't necessarily understand risk. Um, at the same time, there wasn't a lot of capacity to actually settle and execute like insurance products from start on, from the pricing side all the way to the end on the, kind of the settlement side. And so we take like, we're pretty much a one-stop shop. Um, we price risk for farmers, we price risk for aggregators, we price risk for governments. So your micro, meso, um, like I, I find those terms like they're useful for development agencies, but they're not useful for like normal people. Like it's it's completely confusing. I find half of the time. But anyway, so like I would say we we take care of the whole chain. Um, we work together with over forty plus insurance companies. Um, I would say ten reinsurers at this point. We work at this point across. 22 markets, um, 17 of them in Africa, four of them in Asia, um, insured 5.1 million smallholder farmers since we started, uh, insured over a billion dollars worth of agriculture investment, and over 3 million hectares worth of um, agricultural land. That's pretty much us. Great. Anuj?
Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I'm Anuj. I'm from uh, I'm co-founder and CEO of WRMS. Uh, we are a company in agriculture and climate risk management. Uh, started in 2004 primarily for uh, developing weather index insurance, which was basically uh, the product which uh, uh, which was first offered to farmers in India way back uh, in 2003, and that gave us uh, motivation to start a separate company to design, develop, and implement uh, index insurance solutions because we found that most of the insurance companies were really not having that expertise. And uh, so that has been our journey. We have worked in almost uh, all kinds of uh, parametric insurance solutions, again, micro, meso, and uh, macro level. We work with governments in India, uh, in, in Bangladesh, in Cambodia, and Fiji. Uh, and uh, about 10 other countries. Uh, overall, about 5 million uh, farming and uh, uh, low-income households uh, covered. We have helped uh, manage about $2.5 billion of uh, 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 risk for farmers largely, and uh, chiefly in India, but then also in South Asian countries like Indonesia and uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, so that's about us, and we are right now working on City Farm Solution. It is basically farm level uh, yield guarantees for smallholder farmers because we see that uh, uh, basically uh, in micro insurance, uh, it's very difficult to manage basis risk uh, for the farmer to understand that. And that's how we decided that we'll offer farm level yield guarantees, and we'll talk about it uh, about it later. Thank you. Thank you, and finally, Bessie. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, and it's great to be here on this panel. I've been really looking forward to this conversation um, with everybody and awesome to be here with these two other um, really cool organizations. Um, in many ways, Cloud Street comes at this uh, from a different angle. Um, uh, Cloud Street is a really does focus more on the whether macro or whatever you want to call kind of the larger level of uh, insurance work, um, primarily at the government or the large uh, corporate level. Um, we're also primarily a technology platform first and work through partners. Um, so I probably should have said I'm the co-founder and CEO of Cloud Street. Um, but more specifically, what we do is um, um, track floods globally in near real time um, analyze flood risk as it changes through a system that we build without using ground equipment. Uh, we specifically have been working originally with Google um, and now with a variety of different partners in order to fuse 15 different satellites, radar, optical, microwave, uh, down to 30 centimeter resolution using AI and then community intelligence through our partners um, on the ground. Uh, for folks who may or may not know in the audience here, uh, this technology, which I think many of the other uh, folks in Indonesian Bros use here, uh, is really critical for parametric flood insurance or index um, insurance. And very quickly, for folks who may not know, that essentially uses a proxy data trigger to provide the payout rather than a person or field appraiser um, on the ground. Um, what Cloud Street really focuses on is doing the opposite of traditional flood mapping and the opposite of traditional flood insurance by doing um, everything from, from the sky. Um, we started working on this, as I mentioned, with Google about um, eight years ago. I'm um, really proud to say that our science was on the cover of Nature about two months ago. Uh, we released that paper alongside the largest database of flood maps in the world, um, all for free. The data set itself revealed 86 million people who are at risk who had not been identified before by more traditional flood models. Um, we've primarily used the platform to provide critical information to governments at the national level in 18 countries um, around the world, primarily in developing and emerging markets. Uh, those governments today are using the system to monitor um, 300 million people, uh, distribute uh, aid and emergency services like search and rescue, to hundreds of thousands of people in any given rainy season, uh, relocate uh, vulnerable people and things like that. But really over the years, as we were working with governments, the primary thing we kept hearing from them is fantastic. Now that we have all this information to understand when a community needs search and rescue, 
or that we should be providing flood protection over here, with what additional money do you expect me to go take those actions? Now that data is no longer a problem. And at the same time, we were having um, global, some of the largest global insurers, reinsurers, and brokers come to us to say, we've never had the data in these locations to underwrite effectively um, for the types of risk that we're interested in. As uh, Tim mentioned, there's a massive protection gap in emerging markets. So about a year and a half ago, we began working with two key insurance partners to design a parametric technology on top of our um, our existing flood information systems. Uh, and we're now using that at the sovereign level, meaning the sort of national government level, um, in order to offer insurance to about 60 million or to cover 60 million people through uh, the national uh, government. And happy to get more in depth about what that is uh, uh, versus um, kind of other components of ensuring the economy. Um, but as Tim mentioned, this is a, an essential part, I think, of how we're going to build risk transfer, particularly in the, in the uh, developing world. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, Betsy you touched on something on the technology side that's enabled some of the work you've been able to do and the products you're creating and the analytics. Um, but yeah, Rose, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, because Pula and then in your previous work in the insurance space, I mean, certainly there have been a lot of new advances in technology uh, that have allowed you to do what you do. I'd be curious, um, A, you know, what have been kind of those tailwinds that you've ridden in advances in remote sensing, GIS, whatever it is, and then, um, you know, not necessarily conversely, but where where does that kind of um, opportunity end? Like, where's that kind of tech and touch nexus for the work you're able to do? I would say the biggest technology, or biggest technology tailwind is the smartphone. Like, I think, you know, like our, um, like, I think still, like, and this is, this usually doesn't make me very popular when I say this, and, and we certainly use satellite technology like, to, to a large extent, but like the biggest change, like, like insurance is such a trust, it's, it's a product that relies on trust, right? So people are buying your product and people here are meaning like smallholder farmers or government officials. And I see this in, in like at, at both levels. You'll see a government official who's extremely well educated has been to the same university as I have been. And, you know, you come up and you describe this model to them. And, and like, as Bessie said, it's this proxy, right? So it's not exactly what they're looking for, but it, you're measuring it through something else. And they're kind of looking at you. And, and the more technology there is in there, you know, like the often, like the more questioning their face becomes in the beginning. So they really, um, like we, we found that, like, you know, adding a level of like few people on the ground um, equipped with smartphones helps us like I like what, what Bessie was saying in terms of like it's it's you, you want to combine what comes on the ground and you want and with what comes from the sky like we have we have a product where we use we call it field sense and we have another product that like is aptly called skyfall um, and one of my Nigerian clients said hey so we start we get uh, we sense what is going on in the field and then we wait to see what the sky will fall from what will fall from the sky and I think that's really like where you want to be at the moment, like and, and how you want to approach things. So you want to build like insurance if you're selling insurance to whoever it is, you want to build trust through a level of things that they can see and touch. Um, and having like field observations, I think is really key and critical to growth. I, I remember coming like one, like we don't do anything in India, but I remember started like having a conversation with um, people in the Indian insurance market, and we were like, well, what about using satellite? And they were like, there's no way we're gonna get farmers to buy into that if it's purely that. And so you have to look at a combination of factors. And as, as you, if you wanna reach scale, you have to get buy-in from your customer. Like, I think we, we look at our, these products from a perspective of like, hey, you know, this is a really good thing for you to buy, but we don't often think about how the buying journey is. What is the customer, like how does the customer experience this product? If the customer has zero interaction with you and at the end of the season, at the cropping season, you come to them and say, there is a payout. And they're like, wow, awesome, how much? And if it's not if it's not big enough, they'll be like, well, go home and redo your, redo your calculation. Whereas if throughout the season they've seen your people, you know, they've interacted with you, they've had some kind of interaction with you, that really, you know, increases your chance of that client renewing. We've had really good renewal rates, like, like 85% for the last five, six years that we've been there. And like the key to that is like having that interaction and, and understanding that what your client wants has a certain level of low tech as well as a certain level of high tech. 
All right, thanks for that. Anuj, I'd be curious to hear uh, how you respond uh, to that. I know in our conversation a few weeks back, we talked about the importance of yeah, wraparound services besides just your core insurance uh, insurance product. Yeah, uh, Tim, uh, so while uh, I agree to Rose that yes, smartphone is the, probably the, the technology which uh, farmers understand and look up to. So what we have actually started doing is uh, during the course of our work with the farmers, we realized that a lot of these solutions are not getting implemented because high basis risk. Uh, uh, in fact, a lot of farmers are losing crop more often than they should. And that's when we dis uh, we realized that it is very important to fuse ag tech, agriculture technology and tell farmer what has to be done. So a lot of risk which are uh, idiosyncratic in nature can be managed by technology and telling farmer from time to time. Uh, fortunately for us in India, uh, actually the smartphone revolution, uh, uh, the big data, cloud and remote sensing changes have all happened at the same time. And India has a very, very high penetration of smartphones, uh, even in rural areas compared to a lot of other uh, small older countries. So what we started doing is that we started offering farmers uh, a package of advisory services. And if they were following those advisories, uh, most of these were monitored digitally uh, using, again, uh, technology like remote sensing, IOTs, uh, and uh, mobile phones. And we have feet on street, basically on ground in the farm. Uh, so we visit farmer, we advise. There is a lot of more interaction which happens. and. Uh, and during the course of this interaction, we've also realized that it's much easier to sell inputs to the farmer. So that adds the whole value to the farmer. He gets the he or she gets the right kind of inputs and they apply those inputs and minimize the risk. And when uh, the input application, both in terms of irrigation, pest and disease, were all linked to EgTech. So basically, we were telling the soil moisture is low, you should do the irrigation. And uh, we have worked with lots of companies in India, including PepsiCo, Bayer, and we have been able to prove that a farmer was able to save one irrigation or he was able to optimize, or she was able to optimize the pest and disease spray. And that saved, I mean, there was a direct linkages to the risk management and EgTech. And in, in that sense, even after doing that, uh, if the farmer is losing the crop, uh, they are getting paid for it. And a very good validation of this just happened when uh, there was a flood. Uh, farmer was actually looking forward to get a yield which was about 20% higher because of the solutions which were offering to the farmers. Uh, farmer. And there was a sudden flood. And the farmer told us that, okay, I was checking your application every day and doing whatever you were suggesting. And I was looking forward to a very good yield uh, this season because of uh, whatever amends I could make in the crop. Uh, based on your suggestion, but unfortunately, this flood has happened. Uh, so when the farmer got the payout on account of that, uh, that event, he or she realized that, okay, this is helping them out. And that was basically a validation of uh, how the convergence of risk management with AgTech uh, can help farmer, one, primarily to reduce the risk, and in case it cannot be reduced, in this case, which was a one in 20 year flood, which has happened, uh, to get paid for it. So I think uh, for us, uh, uh, the technology has been both used in terms of uh, advising farmer when and what and how to do it, and also uh, to settle the farmer uh, quickly in case there is, a, there is a loss. So we monitor farms very regularly, almost on a daily basis, and uh, there are algorithm-based triggers which allow us to uh, go on the field in case we see that there is a deviation from what the crop growth should be than what it actually is. And that helps us in you know, selectively monitoring farms wherever we see that there is a possible loss and advising farmer first to mitigate and uh, manage the loss. And in case that, that doesn't happen, we pay. Uh, at the back of it, we cover ourselves for all homogeneous risk. We basically bundle them in form of index insurance solution. So for us, farmer doesn't understand index insurance or proxy insurance so easily. So for, for the farmer, the solution is quite simple. You lose your yield, you do the things, uh, you have done the right thing, you still lost the yield, you're getting paid for it. But for us, all homogeneous risk gets transferred uh, to insurance market and we buy basically an index insurance solutions to cover that. So uh, for us, it's basically fusing the technology and, uh, and the risk management together 
and offering it to the farmer along with the inputs and uh, market images. Great, thanks. Bessie, I'd love if you could speak to this uh, from you know the types of policies you guys are helping construct and then maybe a little bit of background on kind of the pain points you've actually addressed in the you know in designing mm. those products or helping insurers and in design those products. Yeah. Uh, definitely. So I mean Claudia Street sits in I think a pretty different place in the value chain uh, than the other folks here. We also are fairly narrow in it, um, in that we provide the analytics band directly to insurers, reinsurers and, and, and brokers. Uh, we are not the distribution. We are not, we don't do very much actuarial work. We really are what's called in the industry, the calculation agent um, and the analytics or the hazard model that the uh, insurers then build their uh, structuring on, on top of. So just to be clear about kind of where we sit, but I really wanted to, I uh, very much agree with the underlying points about trust being probably the most essential thing here, um, especially as we're building more robust insurance markets and different types of risk transfer, really broadening out our conception of what insurance actually means in very new places. Trust is really essential here. And we see that in a very different type of context, I think, than we've been talking about within the insurance industry um, itself. And with that, it's really much more driven by status quo. But I mean, I would say at this point in our relationship with insurers, actual trust and really reputational cover for using a different type of data and offering a different type of insurance product. So parametric is very, a very, very small part of how the overall insurance market is actually uh, conducted. For them to do take both of those leaps to do those two types of innovation, the trust and the reputational cover is just as essential as the accuracy of our models right now. They care just as much that what we've done is val like validated. There's other folks who can say this is legitimate, that they have a little bit of cover as the accuracy of what we're providing them overall. I do think that will start shifting a bit, but that's always really important. Because, it's, I mean, insurance is essentially just a gamble. It's just replacing bet and on whatever the best available information um, is. And insurers, so talking about just that part of the value chain here, um, in trust, they're just going to go with the status quo. Like insurers today, I mean, I, we also work quite a bit in the American market here where there is a, uh, a really robust insurance industry that is completely public, fully backed by the, the American government, 90% or, or more of it. And it's largely based on flood maps that pretty much everyone acknowledges from the government to the insurance industry to, I think at this point, largely the vast majority of the American public realizes is inaccurate and in many cases missing, particularly missing for the most vulnerable communities in, in the US. And yet it is still hard to make a change from that status quo um, to something that that we all know is is more accurate. And so I think building up trust within the insurance industry to really try new things, to get into new markets, to use different types of technologies, to use better data, even if they you know, have already acknowledged that it is better data, but the first year that you use it takes some real real cover. I think that's really essential as we talk about building different types of markets in, in different types of places and really bringing in the kind of capital that we're just, we know we're going to need from these larger places, these larger players in, into these, into these markets. Um, so that said, the, the other thing I just want to touch on as well from a scientific perspective is um, I, um, we always say that we would trust the person with standing in a, uh, six inches of water at their feet more than the box flying over their head saying whether or not it's flooded there or not. I think the difficulty is a lot of what I think Rose and Anusha are working on, which is actually getting that um, information embedded into the underlying um, models that we're using as well. And the way that we use community intelligence through our partners, which is primarily the, the government and the first responders who, who they have, um, we use that as um, training data and ground truth data um, in the work that we do so that any detection in where we're working in Ghana also improves the algorithm in California. And I think that just is an interesting, in many ways, allegory to the way that 
risk and our kind of future solutions to climate risk are really dependent on everybody. We all depend on each other in order to create them. Great, thanks. Rose and Anuj, either, either one of you can go first, but I'd be curious to hear about how you kind of manage the, the economics uh, of your distribution channels, um, given that yeah, FaceTime with farmers is, is critical. Um, you know, you're, you're undoubtedly using smartphones and other technology to decrease that cost, but how have you approached making this economically viable um, you know, at scale, given that you guys are reaching millions and millions of farmers at the moment with different policies? I don't know, Rose, or either one field to take it first. Uh, I can start off. Uh, I think for us, the scale, uh, we realized one thing that to scale it quickly uh, and at the, at the size which we wish to achieve, and I'm talking more from the perspective of the integrated solutions which we are offering at a micro level, not the meso and macro insurance, which obviously is done through B2B channels, but this solution of Farm, wherein we are integrating EdTech with risk management and also, uh, so primary driver is uh, to scale it up and to actually offer the solution, uh, I would say profitably, is to integrate uh, inputs, which is what we are doing in the markets in India, where we are offering inputs along with the advisory and more optimized uh, input offtake, which is happening, and also making market linkages. So for us, uh, uh, how we are able to uh, plan to scale it up is uh, uh, basically connect all these dots together and put feet on street, uh, or feet on ground to actually uh, provide these solutions. So obviously this requires capital, but uh, it basically is whatever uh, is happening in India, there is a lot of uh, uh, technology-based input sale, which is happening uh, through mobile applications and through uh, advisories. Uh, we are just adding one more layer to it and offering a risk management support and making it much more believable for, for farmer to really subscribe to what we are offering. And that has held up in, in, in terms of scale. When we work in a village, uh, if we start with X number of farmers, every season it's actually getting doubled. And primarily, uh, it also increases the offtake of inputs that helps us in expanding faster. And uh, uh, this has also helped us in tying up with critical pieces, which is uh, input companies and output organizations. And they, in turn, are actually helping us making this model more b 2 b to c So it's helping us in scaling by connecting uh, to these organizations and reaching out to the farmers who are already working with uh, them. So that helps us in basically scaling up uh, by using agri-value chain players and also uh, the farmer groups uh, which are and the credit institutions. So we are working with a lot of credit institutions in India who are actually providing the farm credit or farm group credit, which is what we call as farmer producer groups in India. And uh, there are lots of them, about three and a half million farmers in India are connected to some producer groups. So uh, uh, so these are the groups which we are targeting to reach out to the farmers. So that's how the scales uh, is coming. Uh, but when initial stage, in this year, we are probably going to offer this kind of solution at a micro level to about 50,000 farmers. Uh, along with input, along with micro uh, linkages. But I think uh, there is uh, absolutely uh, 4x growth, which we are projecting for next year uh, uh, with whatever business plan. Hey, Rose, how's that compared to how you see it? I would say, like, you know, like our, our focus is, is we've kind of oscillated. We've gone to, like, we did quite a bit of B2B to C for a while and then found it really difficult to make those margins work. Um, and I think we're, at the moment, we're pretty hard on just B2B, B2G. Um, we do a slight bit of like kind of more B2B to C at the moment, but we're careful because the margins are very difficult to make them really kind of work at scale. Um, and, and I think, you know, like, you know, if you find, if you're running, um, if you're running an enterprise and, and and you find something that where the margins are decent. Like I've actually, like the market for that, I used to think that the market for that was much smaller. It is quite large, actually. It's a significant a significant opportunity. And so that the, it's, I think B2B is sometimes a bit hard because the closing cycle is very is very long. Like your your cycle to you close, I think we did, we did some maths on the third day and we, and like my commercial managers like balked at this, but I think our closing cycle takes about eight and a half months to close a deal. And, you know, just the reality, man. 
Um, Whereas, of course, if you're doing if you're doing micro, then the reality is that you know you could close the deal on a day by day basis. And that has a lot of gratification in there. Um, but I think if you're if you're running a sustainable enterprise, I think the key thing is to is to understand that you know margins matter. Like I am all about like the storytelling and, and the part of that and the picture of you know somebody who just had insurance. But in the end, I'm start and you know we're trying to all of us here are trying to run businesses and, and trying to make sure that they scale and grow. And if you have a ne negative margin business, you can't scale, you can't grow. So, you know, from our perspective, it's, it's, it's like we really are pretty focused on having like B2B and B2G opportunities that we pursue, at, whether we execute them on a, mice, on a micro, meso or a macro level, like it, it's, that's really up to the client to decide. It's just, I think insurance, the, the, the way that it's structured and set up is, is very, you really have to understand the psychology of insurance. Like I've been selling insurance for the last 10 plus years and I myself do not like buying insurance. Like it's, it's, I still consider it as a cost. I'd rather not have it. So if that's coming from like, who's arguably one of the strongest advocates for insurance, if that's my personal perspective, then, you know, like we have to be honest to ourselves. Like when you talk to your clients, that that's also going to be the case, you know, like I, I'm, I love what Bessie was saying around, Hey, you know, everybody knows that this is a really old flood map, but it's really difficult for them to change to the new flood map. And because like change requires people taking risk and when risk, you know, you're, you basically put your ass on the line. Right. So, and that's, you know, and you're, you are the hydrologist in the, you know, whether you're the hydrologist in the ministry of agriculture in the U S or the hydrologist in the ministry of agriculture in, in Nigeria, you know, like those, um, those risk profiles are fairly similar and people are very unlikely to make those changes. And so, you know, like I would say for like in a, in a distribution structure, it can be very tempting to kind of go to a B2C model. But I think in insurance, we have to be very cognizant of like in all of in, in these developing markets where we say the protection gap is huge, you know, like in the developed markets, the way that this market has grown is through a B2G and a B2B model. And so it will be like, there's some, there's some really interesting stats. Like if you take the current, like for agriculture insurance, the current overall um, penetration, if I'm not mistaken, is if you remove, like I think is, like in Asia is around the 20, like just, I think it's around, it's somewhere between 15 and 20%. Um, and if you remove the Indian market, which is largely like a, um, a compulsory product, like, I don't, I don't know, maybe you, maybe you argue with that, but from my perspective, it's basically a loanee product. Like if, if the farmers don't take a loan, then they don't get insurance. And the percentage of, of farmers that buy voluntarily is very low. Now, if you take away, if you take away the percentage in, in Asian market penetration, if you take away the Indian market and that particular scheme, you go from 15 to 3% insurance penetration, which is very similar to what we have in Africa. So it's like, or and it's, it's and even similar, and if you look in Latin America, if you take out the Mexican scheme out of the Latin American scheme, you get to very, a very similar kind of low penetration rates. So if that is a worldwide effectively phenomenon, then you have to kind of think, then, you know, it's not it's not about what Rose or Anuj is doing, right? It's about this is how people's psychology towards insurance works. And I'm, you know, like, I, yeah, like I, I just, I've learned that I have to listen to those kind of macros, macro numbers. Yeah, I appreciate that. And Bessie, I'd love to hear, I mean, dovetailing on this, you guys have the disaster analytics suite, which, you know, for years was kind of, or the first few years was your 5G product and specifically sold to governments and now, you know, like you kind of indicated in, in the opening, um, segueing into sovereign risk insurance. We'd love to hear kind of, yeah, your reactions to that sales cycle, building trust, and then, yeah, looking at kind of the sovereign risk macro level insurance. How are you, how, how do you see um, making that sustainable? Like, how is that actually financed? How is it structured? We'd love to hear your perspective on like the market. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's so many threads to to pick up on here. Um, I'll try to answer your question directly and maybe even answer the question that I didn't fully answer last time. But um, yeah, I really respect what Anuj and Rose do since, I mean, Cloud Street is, again, very narrow in the value chain and really a data analytics provider. Uh, and so that's uh, in part in an effort to ensure that the you know, we can we have margins and a sustainable business in what we do, but we're very cognizant of what part of the market and part of our theory of change that we're not able to touch because we get so narrow. And 
um, try to work with partners on the ground. And then also I'd say the, the biggest cost sink for us is a lot of the customer support that we provide first with our existing product directly to the governments to enable to, to do trainings uh, and to enable them to uh, understand, use the data that we have, and then help adjust their standard operating procedures when it comes to emergency response or when it comes to thinking through different planning decisions around infrastructure or zoning or, or, or things like that, um, and to put some real um, effort into, into that work. Um, I um, The uh, entryway into insurance uh, for us um, really does come from the sort of from this more top, like larger scale top down perspective. And as Tim has been talking about, we really started by leveraging the trust that we had with the existing governments that we were working with and their, I think, real need and very obvious, clear need for capital to take the kinds of actions that we were um, that we were doing and even just to pay for the uh, subscription for our service that they often needed support financing in. Uh, the almost every government that we we work with has talked about a real interest in transferring risk and getting some kind of insurance um, for for themselves as the sovereign to pay for uh, large disasters or pay for preparation work that they wanted to do um, ahead of time. Which more and more, more the insurers who we work with are interested in in supporting and helping to invest in. Um, so I think that's really um, exciting move for the first entryway where we're going. Again, this kind of mostly at the national level work and primarily in um, Africa. As we expand into other business lines, all through our insurance partner. So we don't, we're not an insurance brand, um, at, at least at this point. Um, we are really working with whatever the kinds of business lines that they are interested in bringing us and underwriting via the data set and the technology uh, that that we have. Um, for, I, um, I think these other business lines, building trusts are going to get, um, is will be more difficult with their direct. So the other things that we are, um, is currently being structured on our technology is supplemental homeowners um, insurance uh, and business interruption or supply chain insurance. And I just want to spend a moment to talk about this last one. Um, I think that there is an increasing understanding of what risk could be. So to Rose's point, I completely agree that even like, I don't like even the brokers who we work with are like, oh yeah, I don't have flood insurance on my home because that would be a pain in the butt to, to pay for. Um, and I, I do think that at least at the kind of corporate and government level, so less at the individual purchaser, I do think a sense of risk is changing for, and I think two big factors driving that are one, these larger events uh, happening around the world. And we particularly look at flooding, but if you just take the uh, the disasters in China, the disasters in uh, in Germany, the disasters where, where I'm from in the mid-Atlantic in the US that got a ton of press coverage is really, I think, changing folks' understanding of kind of the unpredictable. And I just want to say that is not to mention the massive floods that we were responding to in the Rohingya refugee camps in Nigeria and in Ghana that were equally devastating, just don't get the same level of coverage. Um, the second thing is just the pandemic, which I think is just an obvious shift in people's sense of risk and interest in preparing ahead of time, whether it's through actual action or for coming up with a financing scheme. The um, pandemics disrupted something like and caused something like $4 trillion in GDP loss. Like these numbers are a little bit squishy, and I think it actually could be higher than that. Um, and the amount of supply chain risk that is currently still affected by what's happening now, I think, has sent pretty big shockwaves through um, the corporate world, at least from the folks that we talk to. And we've seen risk managers and CFOs who are much more eager to look at more types of um, uh, risk transfer in various places and take that portfolio more seriously and invest in it in a more serious way and getting more mandates from their board and, and their bosses. So again, I'm talking at kind of a higher level, not the in, not the kind of individual's risk uh, profile, but I think at these larger kind of movers of the economy, being like national governments and large uh, corporates, we are seeing a... Um, a shift in interest to invest in insurance 
um, more broadly because of a real sense of, of changing risk. And we are just wrapping up here, but I guess maybe we could do one last quick round, um, hopefully ending on a, a positive note. Um, I'd love to hear what each of you, you know, is particularly excited about, whether, you know, within your own company um, or just generally kind of the insure tech sector, like what makes you optimistic about the future? Um, where, like, where do you th see things headed that make you, that make you quite excited? Maybe Anuj will we'll start with you and then, then Rose and then closing out with Bessie. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, I think uh, primarily if you have seen that uh, uh, 2021 and 2020, the risk events have increased. And I see that a uh, lot of uh, pandemic, as uh, Bessie has said, that has uh, made people aware about uh, what are the risks which they need to cover and what they need to look for. Uh, plus, more important thing is, and we are very gungo about that uh, from the smallholder perspective and Indian context or South Asia context is that uh, we have started working with farmers to uh, uh, give what a lot of positive connotations to whole risk management by talking about risk reduction and uh, yield improvements before we talk about yield, uh, covering the risk or risk management part of it. So uh, as uh, Rose was mentioning that a uh, lot of what renewables are, are associated with last season's claim. So even in Indian crop insurance market, if there is a good claim last year, you would find that voluntary uptake is huge. Uh, example is Maharashtra and a lot of other Indian states where uh, the voluntary uptake, uh, uh, uptake is huge because there was a last season claim. So uh, rather than associating risk uh, management with a lot of loss and compensation. I think we are not talking more about the uh, uh, minimizing, mitigating the risk and improving the yields of the farmers. And for us, that's something which is actually gaining a lot of traction. And I see that this opportunity uh, is completely associated with changing the way the agriculture is done uh, in a lot of smallholder markets. And that's how uh, uh, what makes us gungo because you will have to start producing more from the same piece of land. And probably that's an opportunity which can uh, which uh, can be harnessed, and risk management can can be linked to that that opportunity. And that's what we are trying to do. That uh, a lot of positive connotations in terms of uh, helping farmer grow more or grow better from the same piece of land, uh, and uh, uh, at the same time helping farmer to invest more in technology and uh, without worrying about losing the crop uh, on account of uh, adverse events and that's where i see that there's a large opportunity and uh, uh, and almost all the farmers we speak to are extremely interested in such kind of solutions which are helping them earn more uh, while ensuring that the risk is getting managed so uh, that's about it for us uh, uh, thanks a lot Rose or Bessie, feel free to jump in and close this up. Okay, sorry. Um, okay. I would say the overall development in the sector, I think there's there's an increasing amount of investment and interest in it. I think, you know, what, what people are still f figuring out is, 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 as you asked a couple of times, is a distribution model. And whoever cracks the distribution model with a decent, like, unit economics behind it will make it work. That's, I don't have any doubt. Like, I think product wise, I think there's a number of really good products in the market. I think distribution wise, we're still not completely there yet. I think that's the biggest challenge for the sector. Bessie, over to you. Um, I guess I see I mean, one thing that I'm excited about. Uh, hard to pin down the, the most, but is the amount of uh, true investment, like cap capital overall broadly conceived that's really coming into this. It is also something that scares me quite a bit. Like I think both the amount of, I'll just stick with, I think what probably many folks here at SOCAP think about, but the amount of billion dollar, close to billion dollars climate tech funds that are popping up right now and the amount of then talent that's uh, being reallocated in many ways from more um, 
extractive or uh, industries into climate tech, I think is really encouraging. And I think is just flat out necessary. Like we need that capital. We need that effort in order to create the kinds of solutions, not just for adaptation and risk transfer, like what we're talking about here, but for the broad changing the broader economy overall. Um, it also, um, I think is a, uh, scary to me in the sense that anytime you kind of pour money into an, into something and then you try to make, um, you know, as we were talking about, you have to make margins on it if there's going to be a scalable business opportunity in it. It scares me in the sense that um, we won't have the new systems oriented towards the most vulnerable people. And I say this as someone who really, as I've been emphasizing throughout this, really does stick to the more high level and uh, doing only one part of the, the value chain, at least at, at this moment. And so I think the amount of new resources we have to solve these problems um, makes me more hopeful that we'll crack problems like um, the distribution problem um, that uh, Rose was just talking about here and a number of a number of other things. Um, but I think we really need, do need to have ways that safeguard against um, continuing with the same side, sorts of um, systemic injustice that we have and got us into the problem in the beginning. And I guess I'll just say, um, to try to make that a little bit more down to the ground, um, I want to be clear why I'm said in the, a bit, I respect what Anuj and Rose do so much, is that I just think that have me ensuring that we have the voices of the most vulnerable and actually have their say built into these products is quite necessary. And I see the, the types of products that we're building in the interest from the industry that we are getting as they make as they ensure does not necessarily include uh, really thoughtful, um, necessarily thoughtful uh, products of, about wh who should be taking what kind of risk, what should be done by public financing, what is appropriate for private financing, what is actually better for private financing. Um, and I really want to make sure that we have various stakeholders at the table as we're having these even larger uh, conversations um, that we do at Cloud Street. Great. Thanks, everybody. We're a little bit over time, so I'll wrap up. But thanks thanks so much, Anuj, Bessie, Rose, uh, to convene. Uh, last thing I'll mention is, uh, and I know multiple of you guys here have been part of the InsureTech series that we just launched yesterday with uh, Case at Duke University. So I'll pop the link in, but we'll be releasing about six articles and deep dive into kind of the InsureTech and microinsurance space uh, over the coming month. And so if you want to go deeper in the topic, uh, feel free to take a look. Uh, the first article was published yesterday. And more to come. But thanks so much, and uh, everybody have a great rest of your day.